Well, greetings, Series 7 test takers. This is a Series 7 guru coming to you from my studio here in fabulous Las Vegas. I've had many requests for a lecture on non-equity options, and I just uh, don't think the content in terms of how much of it's on the test is lends itself well to a narrative kind of lecture. So what I thought what might be more helpful is just to grab uh, 20 questions, way more than you're ever gonna receive, uh, receive on your actual exam and explicate those 20 questions, talk about what you could expect in uh, terms of non-equity options. Uh, you know, if you miss a mark and you tell me it's because of non-equity options, I'm gonna say, yeah, I don't know if I believe that or not. So anyways, that's what we're gonna do. A uh, shout out to uh, Kaplan. Uh, Kaplan allows my viewers, uh, subscribers and members free look at uh, Kaplan questions. And so we're just gonna pull 20 from the Kaplan QBank. If you don't have a Kaplan QBank, I highly recommend it as a paid supplement. With well, my Guru 10 discount code, the Guru 10 discount code works for any Kaplan product or service, uh, but the QBank, uh, which is the best in the business for the Series 7 can be yours for about uh, $60. Best free supplement is certainly the YouTube channel, uh, but if you're interested in getting a, grabbing a Kaplan QBank, 3,600 questions, you can customize them uh, very much like we're doing here. All right, let's get busy on this. A investor believes that the U.S. dollar will rise in value against the British pound. Now, I'm not being facetious here. The U.S. dollar is not a foreign currency. The U.S. dollar is never going to be the right answer. There's an inverse relationship with currencies. So to tell me the dollar is going up or down is kind of a meaningless discussion, unless you tell me to what, right, in relationship to. So if we say the U.S. dollar is rising, that means the British pound is falling. So the profit will limit the risk. Now, one thing you want to keep in mind in non-equity options is non-equity options have more things in common than they do differences. So you know what happens is people get a non-equity option, but what that means, by the way, is the underlying interest isn't a stock. And they get one of these and they go, oh my God, that's a foreign currency question. As long as you don't freak, you're going to be okay. So as you can see here, it says to profit with limited risk. So you don't need to know anything about foreign currency options. No limited risk means we're going to pay the premium. So we already know this is going to be buying a call or buying a put on the British pound. Because remember, we can't do anything on the dollar. Which of the following foreign currency option transactions would you recommend? Okay, dollar's going up, British pound's going down. I think we want to buy a put on the British pound. Um, oh, good news. We got it right. Got it right. All right, let's see what our next one is. Um, investors should buy puts on the British pound. This is just the explanation. Should buy puts on the British pound to lock in the highest possible price at which to sell the pounds. And the answer must be framed in British pounds. So what we're trying to say there is what Dean said, is uh, make sure you stay focused on the foreign currency. All right, let's look at our next one. Question two. A investor buys a yield-based September 70 call on a 30-year treasury bond for a premium of two and a half. Again, more things in common than differences. And so what I'm gonna do is get my T just like I would in any other option contract, fire up the T as we always say, and I always like to use dollars out, dollars in. We bought a yield-based call. By the way, yield-based calls, yield-based calls have a direct relationship with interest rates. I would definitely know that. You know, I can't imagine, you know, as I said, you're only going to get three or four of these, but we just don't know which three or four. So you got to be prepared. So make sure you know yield-based options have a direct relationship. What I mean by that is if you think interest rates are going up by a yield-based call. So here, if I'm buying this uh, call, I'm thinking that interest rates are going to rise. Now, what makes that tricky is we spend all this time telling you about the inverse relationship of interest rates and bond prices. And here I'm telling you, this is not inverse, it's direct. So let's see, we paid uh, two and a half here. I like to do on a per share basis. So 2.5. It says uh, now it's 7.95. So 7.95, again, is gonna be have intrinsic value. So it's a 70 call, that 70 represents 7%. So 9.95 means it's 950 or nine and a half points of the money. So we're gonna put that here, right? Cause we're gonna close out. Again, more things in common, the differences. And again, where a lot of people uh, get hung up on options is not knowing what a closeout is. It means offset. 
So we bought that, we did an opening purchase, so now we're gonna do a closing sale. And we're gonna do that for nine and a half. And it looks like the difference in that is gonna be, uh, I'm a winner, right? You know, when you buy an option to be a winner, you have to be right about three things. Direction, here we're saying up, interest rates are going up. How far up? At least seven and a quarter, we gotta cover out of pocket costs. And we're saying all this is gonna take place between now and September expiration. And since we're right about all three of those things, please note we're big time winner. What is that, 200, 300% return? So the difference in that seven points or $700. So see, see if that is available to us as an answer. Boom. And that's what that looks like. Let me clean up my slide. Again, the takeaway, make sure you know the yield-based options have a direct relationship with interest rates, a direct relationship. Okay, let's just read the rationales. A September 70 call means the holder is buying a 7% yield. The investor can close the option at the intrinsic value. So 7.95, 7%, there we go, 950. Subtract, profit, there we go. Let's look at our next one. A registered representative would recommend a customer establish a short straddle. So again, uh, this has nothing to do with your understanding of non-equity options. You should know that short straddles are you know, used when you expect something to stay within a trading range, not to move, right? The short straddle on treasury bonds when interest rates are expected. So we're looking for an answer here that says neutral, stay within the trading range, whatever the case may be. There are four things you need to know about straddles. Can you identify a straddle? Can you calculate the break-evens? Can you determine where it's profitable? And then here is the fourth thing, when do you use it? So let's see what our choices are. Yeah, it looks like we want to uh, have remain unchanged, right? Just like if this was a stock. You'd short a straddle on a stock and hope that it remains unchanged. The call expires, the put expires, you keep the money. And again, uh, I don't know how long this is gonna come in. I couldn't decide if we should read the rationales, but why not? Because this is a substitute for what would have been a narrative uh, lecture on non-equity options. If you still want that lecture, I've had a lot of requests. I'm more than happy to do it. I just don't think it's as productive as just grabbing some questions off the Kaplan Quebec and doing it the way we're doing it here. Anyways, any straddle rider is always looking for stable market. That's very testable. Volatility is the biggest enemy of a rider of an option. By the way, that's not only straddle, short call, short put, short straddle, you know, the volatility. You're either buying volatility, not testable, but all speculative strategies. You're either buying volatility or selling volatility. Here we're selling it. Because this question is referring to debt options, the price movements are based upon changes in interest rates. No fluctuations would be good. All right, so let's look at our next one. Question four, an investor purchases two. So just like if this was an equity option, we gotta be a little careful here that there's two contracts we're discussing. So I'm uh, purchasing these calls. And so that means I think the Swiss franc is going up, right? Because when I buy calls, I'm bullish. So I'm bullish on the Swiss franc here. Uh, I'm paying two and a half. Now, again, as they have more things in common than they do differences. But these are in cents per dollar. What I mean by that is you're always going to move your decimal spot two spots to the left. And again, if you don't panic, you're going to be okay. So if we move that two spots left, one spot would be two, and then it'd be 0.025. Right, then we're gonna times that by the two contracts times by the contract size. And we're gonna find out, by the way, even if you didn't know this, you know it has to be you know five something, you know, like $500. So in this case, uh, we move it over two spots, 0.025. You always do that for any of these, by the way, except for the Japanese yet, because that's not in cents per dollar. Anyways. Uh, 0 0.025 times two times 10,000 uh, equals $500. So let's see if uh, $500 is available to us. And again, if you even if you didn't understand what I just said, if Dean would just said there, you say, well, two and a half points on a regular option would be 250 bucks and two of them would be 500. Again, they have more things in common than they do differences. All right, let's see if that answer is available to us. Okay, remember the foreign currency, except for that quote in the sense, there you go. 
That means a purchase, you always move two spots to the left. So make sure you remember Dean telling you two spots to the left, except for the Japanese yet. In fact, I've shown it up here. It's still on the screen for you. Uh, that means a purchase of 2.5 means 0 0.025. One call offered at 2.5 is equal to 0 0.025 times 10. And there's the math. All right, let's look at our next one. Let me clear up the slide. Exchange traded funds have traditionally been based on a spe specified underlying index. In that respect, they're similar to listed index options. Amongst the differences between the two products. So this one's gonna kind of asking about two things that are on the test. ETFs are certainly on the test. You should be able to contrast an ETF with an open and mutual fund to know how an ETF is different. And uh, now they're asking us uh, to contrast this with an index option. All right, so among the differences between the two products, ETFs, exchange traded funds, settle in one business day, while index options sell in two. That is not true, not true. ETFs trade like stocks. Two, ETFs sell in two business days, while index options sell in one business day. All option contracts settle in one business day, T plus one. So two is true of all options, including index options. So two is true, we're looking for two without one. An investor owning an ETF receives the current market price of the ETF when selling the position, while an owner of an index put who exercise receives the intrinsic value. It is very testable to know that index options settle in cash, the cash value of the intrinsic value. Nobody would play with you if I were short an index and I had to deliver the underlying index. So it's gonna be based on the intrinsic value. So here it says the owner of an index put who exercises receives the intrinsic value. So it looks like two and three. Let's see what four says. An investor owning ETF, no, 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 no. And it looks like we need two and three, which is choice uh, C here. And let's see what the rationale says. Yep, there we go. ETF, so like any other exchange traded, uh, any stock, T plus two, options always sell T plus one. Please note, the exercise is going to be in terms of value, and the exercise is different as well. The exercise of the index option is going to be T plus one as well. So, you know, equity options, the contract is T plus one, resulting exercise stock trade is T plus two. And then index options, T plus one for both the option contract and the exercise, that cash. So that cash is due to that holder of the put contract in this example, right? You're the writer, I'm the buyer here. I want it T plus one. All right, let's see what our next one is. While watching the financial news on TV, you hear an internationally recognized economist say that she expects a significant devaluation of the US dollar. Can't stress this enough. You can't do anything on the US dollar. The US dollar is not a foreign currency. So if I'm thinking the devaluation of the dollar, I'm saying the dollar it's not going to be as strong. So, you know, that means if I'm selling my products outside of the U.S., I can get less euros or less yen or less yuan or less, you know, pesos or Swiss francs or British pounds and still get the same number of dollars coming back to me in the U.S. So as a U.S. exporter, uh, when the dollar is devalued, that makes my products internationally more competitive. Now, if the dollar is weak, that means I need more dollars to uh, pay for my uh, scotch. I drink a single malt scotch from Isla called Lagavulin. And if the dollar goes down, Dean needs to come up with more dollars to turn them into British pounds to get my scotch, causing the import, in this case, the scotch to be less competitive. So when the dollar goes down, exports uh, become more competitive and imports become less competitive. Now be careful. On the test, it has a U.S. perspective. So if you have any kind of an international perspective, you are definitely at risk in these kind of questions, right? The center of the financial universe is New York City. From test purposes, the world, world revolves around that, right? All right, so let's see. Uh, the price of foreign goods would decrease, lending to an increase in imports. No, no, no. Just told you, right? My scotch is going to cost me more money. So one is not true. The price of foreign goods would increase. Yeah, my dollars are weak. I'm gonna need more of them to buy my foreign products, whether it's my European wine or my 
my uh, scotch or my, I don't know, what am I going to buy in Asia? My uh, electronics. So uh, that's true. Two is true. The price of U.S. made goods would decrease, lending an increase in exports. Yes. Right. Because now if I'm a U.S. exporter like Boeing, I don't need to get as many euros or, or Swiss francs or British pounds or Chinese yuan or Japanese yen to, uh, you know, pay for my plane. So it's two and three, two and three. Uh, let's see, we have that as a choice. We do, boom. Uh, if the dollar becomes uh, devalued, it becomes less valuable in foreign countries. That means that more dollars are required to purchase the same amount of foreign goods. The increased cost will reduce imports of them. So what they're saying here is that Dean looks at his bottle of scotch and, you know, it used to be uh, $40, now it's $60. And now I say, you know what, maybe I'll drink a bourbon. Bourbon is a whiskey that comes from Kentucky. So, you know, it makes the uh, domestic uh, version of that uh, more competitive. Uh, on the other side, because the foreign currency now goes further in the United States, goods here become cheaper to buy. So, of course, we increase. I have a, a guy uh, in Australia, and I love when he sends me stuff from Australia, he, he packages his Aunt Matilda. But anyways, when I'm trying to, you know, import like Cuban cigars or something like that, Every once in a while, I'll call him and he'll say, Dean, hey, I'm not the right guy right now. The guy you should be using to write based on exchange rates right now is the guy in Ireland. <laughs> so, uh, funny. Index options differ from equity options, which of the following ways, this is very testable. We said index options, the exercise is intrinsic value, cash, and it's T plus one, whereas equity options, you have to deliver the underlying stock T plus two. So that's one major testable difference. Let's see what they offer us. The trade settlement is the next business day. Well, I don't think that's different. I mean, both of them, uh, both option contracts are going to be settled the next business day, T plus one. The equity uh, exercise, there we go, is settled in cash. That's very testable. You definitely need to know that on your exam. So the exercise settlement is in cash. And let's see what our Rationale is, uh, when an index option is exercised, cash is paid to the holder. That's very testable. In contrast, exercising an equity option involves delivering the underlying stock. So make sure you know that difference. And by the way, remember too, it's going to be T plus one on the exercise. And the equity option is going to be T plus two on the exercise. All the contracts are T plus one, but the exercise is different. An investor with a well-diversified portfolio oriented toward growth has 60% invested in the stocks of 28 different companies. She would like to hedge. Hedge means offset risk, right? So then they tell you downside risk, hedge. For the equities, a company using options to do so. Now, if I was worried about a particular selection in my portfolio, I would buy a put on that individual security. If I worried about selection risk or non-systematic risk, it looks like here what I'm worried about is all of those 28 stocks. It sounds like what Dean is worried about here is what's called systematic risk or systemic risk, the tendency of securities prices to move together. So it would be a lot more efficient instead of buying a put on each of my individual selections. You know, if that's what my broker recommended to me, that could be a potential churning kind of a situation, right? If I'm your manager and I come in, I say, why are you buying puts on 28 different stocks? He goes, well, Dean, he's worried about those stocks going down. I said, well, why don't we find an index that most closely approximates his portfolio and buy puts on that index? And then that put contract we have on the index, if the market goes down, the intrinsic value of the put goes up. You know, the put that you're holding will have negative correlation with the stocks in the portfolio. I would uh, know that concept called negative correlation. Things go opposite directions, right? So the put will become more valuable as the market drops. All right, so let's see what our choices are. We're looking for buying an index put. Let's see if that's available to us. And yeah, there we go. Cool. Selling options hedge adds income to the uh, premium. So if they say income, we're going to sell. But protection is limited, right? You, you know, you don't want to hope it happens. You got to be able to make it happen. So the best hedge is always to purchase an option. And here it's gonna be a put. So if you're long uh, something, what you're gonna do is buy a, a, a put. And if you're short the stock or short something, you're gonna buy a call. With so many stocks to hedge, doing so individually would not be cost-effective. 
On the other hand, hedging the entire portfolio, I would also be able, uh, a little more sophisticated, but I would definitely un understand that what this customer is worried about is what's called systematic risk or systemic risk, the tendency of securities prices to move together, right? You're not worried about non-systematic risk or selection risk. If that were the case, right, if I had 28 stocks, and I was only worried about one of them in my portfolio, that'd be selection risk, and I would buy a put on that individual uh, selection. Right, let's see where our next one is. One of the most popular index options is the VIX. You definitely uh, should be prepared for a question on the VIX, sometimes known as the fear index. And it's based on the uh, you know premiums paid for calls and puts. When people get nervous, they're willing to pay more on the put. So we mentioned this concept of a uh, negative correlation. So when the market gets very volatile, you know, typically as the market goes down, the volatility index goes up. And so, you know, if I think the market's going uh, down, I buy a call on the VIX. Anyways, the uh, VIX trades on the Chicago Board of Options Exchange. And uh, I wouldn't worry about this as a, a question so much as on the test is knowing this concept of the VIX as the fear index and a measurement of volatility and how you would profit from volatility very much similar to the yield-based contract we were talking about, you know, what are you going to do in terms of uh, trying to uh, take advantage? Are you going to buy a VIX call or a VIX put? If you think, uh, again, it's counterintuitive, negative correlation, buy a VIX call when you expect volatility rise, which is typically market going down, and then buy a VIX put when you think the market's going up. So. A customer went long 10 Swiss franc puts, 10,000 Swiss francs per contract. You're never going to be required to know how many things they are going to always tell you how many units per contract. That's always given information. Now, as we said, again, what we're going to do is we're going to move our decimal spot two spots to the left. Now, you don't really have to you know, memorize that because you could just know that it's going to be more in common than it is different. So, right, that's going to be point. 0525, right? I'm just moving my decimal lots two spots to the left times 10 contracts times the size, which is 10,000. And let's see if that answer is going to be available to us. Uh, again, it has more things in common than it, do, it does differences. So I'm going to have my calculator 0 0.0525. I just moved my decimal spot two spots to the left times 10 times 10,000 equals 5,250. So what we're looking for is an answer that would be 5,250. Let's see if that answer is available to us. Boom. When a uh, long and option contract, the maximum, oh, did, that, did they ask us that? I still got it right. Yeah, let's see, again, this is just, again, uh, I asked, what are we gonna, I thought they asked us what we're gonna pay and they asked us what we can lose. But again, my proof of my, my original point, they have more things in common than they do differences, right? So you should definitely know that when you buy an option, you buy a call or you buy a put or you buy a debit spread or you buy a straddle, the most you can lose is your premium, right? The worst case here is these put contracts expire worthless and you lose $5,250. Uh, by the way, very easy to qualify somebody who wants to buy an option contract, right? Very easy in terms of qualifying them because this $5,250 you could afford to lose, right? Um, you know, for everybody, that's a different number, by the way. I went along on the maximum loss of the amount paid. So there you go. Let's clean up the slide. one is portfolio insurance. I like that. I like that. Insurance, remember, is in case things don't go according to plan. I don't buy insurance because I plan on wrecking. I pay a premium, key point, I pay a premium for insurance. And my insurance company writes a contract. My insurance policy is a two-party contract. I've paid the premium. My insurance company has written the contract. And they said, Dean, if something happens, let us know and we'll make good. You know, in other words, they will put me back to where I was before I had the accident. You know, the best news is I don't file a claim and they keep the premium, right? 
But if something happens, I had a little fender bender in my garage and had to get my car fixed and get a new garage door opener. I called my insurance company and said, hey, time to perform on the contract. So here, when we say insurance, we know we're going to be buying a pre paying a premium. Now, portfolio insurance. So now I got to think, okay, well, what am I worried about? Because that's what insurance is. Insurance is about what if something bad happens. <laughs> I always joke, insurance agents sell fear and stockbrokers sell greed. You know, insurance agents say, wouldn't life be terrible, Dean? You know, stockbrokers say, wouldn't life be great if, you know, if I'm duly licensed, I can sell both. So I think what I'm going to be worried about is my stock portfolio going down. So I think what I'm going to do is uh, buy some index puts as a uh, portfolio insurance. Let's see if that's available to us. Uh, purchase of a call. Uh, purchase of a call on the underlying security. Yeah, uh, I'm looking for the index as it said portfolio, but now I'm looking at my answer set and they don't offer me uh, what I'm looking for, which was purchasing a put on the underlying index that approximates my portfolio. But since that's the case, they don't offer it to me. I'm gonna go for the thing that's closed, which is purchasing the put. Let's see, purchase a put, that's the downside of the underlying security is known as portfolio insurance. Okay, so cool. So, you know, sometimes, you know, when you, you're looking for an answer that isn't offered to you, then you gotta say, okay, well, what else can I do I have offered? Your customer has noticed the exchange rate for the British pound in the spot market. The spot market is the current, the current market for this. And so do you remember what Dean has said now? I think this is the third, the fourth time I've said this. You move the decimal two spots to the left. So that's gonna be a buck 48, right? Buck 48.47, two spots to the left. Uh, spot market, so if I call my broker, what's the spot market on the peso? What's the spot market on the yen? I'm talking about what is the exchange rate right now? Uh, what do you tell her when she asks what this means? You say one pound equals 14, no. One pound equals, no. Remember, we always move it uh, one spot to the uh, left. So we know it's either going to be, it's either going to be $1 equals, $1 equals 0.48 or the other way around, right? Depending on what they're asking us. So now we got a 50-50. Now when we got a 50-50, we gotta be a little careful about squeezing the trigger because, you know, I call this missing the question on the backside, you know, missing it. So we're going to say, okay, so is it a dollar equals 0.4 or one pound equals $1.47? It's the pound to the dollar relationship that we're looking at, right? So that's the one we're looking at. Cents per pound, there we go. So that was a tough one. That was a tough one. All right, let's see what our next one is. A Japanese manufacturer sells recorders to a US, US retailing firm. So uh, the manufacturers receive a million dollars in 90 days. How can, the how can he best protect himself against the decline of the dollar? So now what I'm worried about, remember, is I'm a Japanese manufacturer and I'm in a dollars and I got to turn into yen. And what I'm afraid of is the dollar goes down and doesn't give me as much yen, right? That's it. By the way, they tell you that that's what he's worried about, devaluing the, uh, the dollar, declining the value. So, I mean, they, by the way, I don't really have to tell you that because, you know, if it's a high-end kind of a question, you got to be able to go in your brain housing group and say, okay, let me think about this. If I'm from the Japanese perspective, selling my products in the U.S., I'm going to get dollars and I got to turn the dollars into yen. So what I want to do is something in the foreign exchange market that would make up for what I'm going to lose in the spot market when I actually do this 90 days from to now. So again, what I'm worried about again is the dollar going up. That means I think the yen is going, uh, the dollar is going down. So that means I think the yen is going up. So what I'm gonna do is buy a put on the yen. So buy yen puts, uh, sounds pretty good. So let's just review again. Japanese manufacturer selling products in the US. It's kind of the opposite. You know, We spent a lot of time on a memory aid called Epic. Exporters buy puts, importers buy calls, but that's from the US perspective. Here, I'm a Japanese manufacturer, so it's gonna be the opposite, right? If I'm actually exporting the US, what I'm afraid of is when I get paid in US dollars, the dollar is weak, and that means the yen is strong, and so I'm gonna buy uh, yen calls. Uh, let's see, because he is receiving US dollars, his uh, risk is the US dollar will go down in value against the Japanese yen. If the dollar goes down against the yen, the yen will rise. Therefore, to protect his risk against a rising yen, he should buy yen calls. There we go. 
And again, that's the point, right? The end calls increase in value. So the, what we're hoping is that we're going to make up in the hedge. The hedge here is those yen uh, call contracts, uh, whatever we're going to lose in the spot market. All right, let's see what our next one is. Uh, an OEX 370 call is purchased at three and a quarter and exercise when the S&P is 381. So a lot of ways to do this. I always like to just kind of get out my uh, scratch paper and say, okay, well, they're telling me it's 381. And what I like to do is kind of compare the uh, market price uh, to the strike price. And so it looks like to me, based on this scenario here that I'm looking at, that that has uh, six points of intrinsic value. Right, so in exercise, the writer delivers which of the following? So be careful, they're not asking what my profit or loss is. That's a different question. If they would ask what my profit or loss is, I would net the three and a quarter against the $600. That's not what this question is asking. So one of the big mantras, you know, that Dina is always sharing with people is RTFQ, RTFQ. Read the full question. So please note this question isn't asking, what is the profit or losses? They're, what they're testing on here, by the way, is very testable. Again, index options, settle in cash. So the writer's gonna deliver to me, the holder, uh, $600. Let's see if $600 is available to us. There we go, 600 in cash, right? That's what that's uh, very testable, by the way. That is very, very testable. Uh, let me clean this slide up. Do we need to go back on that one? Uh, I didn't read the rationale. I've been reading the rationale on that one. I didn't do it. Um, a customer believes the Swiss franc will depreciate. Now, fancy word, that means the franc is going down against the US dollar. Which of the following option strategies would best take advantage of the expected depreciation? So. You know, it's kind of like speculating on companies, except you're speculating on countries, right? So if you're speculating on a company, you think it's going to go down, you would buy a put. And if you're speculating on the country, same thing, you'd buy a put, except you would buy a put on their currency, the currency being a proxy for the country here. So I'm not sure what you don't uh, think is going well in Switzerland. Maybe they're not selling as many watches and cuckoo clocks and, you know, chocolate or whatever the case may be. So uh, must take advantage. I think I'm going to say buy a put because you know if I sell a call and it expires, I just keep the premium, right? And it says take advantage. I think I want to be able to you know strike price you know zero kind of thing. So let's see that's available. I'm going to say buy a put on a Swiss franc. Oh man! So uh, look at this again. Another confirmation of what I told you. As long as you don't panic, these have more things in common than they do differences, and so. We have established already in this question that we're bearish on the Swiss franc for whatever reason. And so we'll just put that there just to remind ourselves. So we're looking for here a bearish strategy. We are looking for a bearish strategy. I want to get a different color here. And let's see. So a credit put spread. No, a credit put spread is bullish. Right? When you do a credit put spread, you're selling the higher strike put and buying the lower strike put just in case you're wrong. In a credit put spread, you want the uh, underlying, here the Swiss right, underlying to be above the strike so you can keep it. Uncovered put writing. When you are writing puts, you're bullish, right? Because again, you're hoping that the contract expires and you get to keep the money. So if it's a put, the way it expires is by the underlying going up. Uncovered call writing, that is certainly bearish. And I, I really think you're kind of stupid to do this I always joke about being a smart bear or a dumb bear. That's a pretty dumb bear, but that's so far the only bearish position I see offered to us. And a debit call spread. No, that is bullish as well. A debit uh, put call spread is when you are actually uh, selling the higher strike, they'll pay for the lower strike. And you definitely want this thing to go up and be able to exercise. So I'm going to say C here only because that's the only um, bearish strategy offered to us. So uh, again, this isn't really an index question, or excuse me, a non-equity option question. This is basically, again, just an option question about option strategies. So again, as long as you don't panic, you should be okay. You should be okay.
All right, let's see what our next one is. Oh, by the way, uh, sorry, I keep forgetting to read the rationales. Uh, call writing is bearish. There we go. Credit puts bridge, debit are all bullish. There we go. Okay, let's see what our next one is. If U.S. corporation exports machines tools to Switzerland and will be paid in Swiss francs. Okay, so what am I worried about as a U.S. corporation? Uh, I sw sell my uh, machine to the, my Swiss friends and the Swiss francs are uh, uh, strong and buy me more dollars. No, that would, life would be wonderful, right? If I can turn my Swiss francs into dollars, get more dollars, that'd be great. So what I'm afraid of is that the Swiss franc is going to go down. And so what I'm going to do again is do something in the options market would do that. We have a great uh, mnemonic. I think everybody should know this if they don't, but it's called EPIC. And that stands for exporters by puts and importers by call. So I just gave you the rationale here. The rationale is, as a U.S. corporation that's over exporting my machine, I'm going to be worried about the foreign currency, the Swiss franc, going down. And so what I'm going to do is buy a put on the Swiss franc. So let's see what's available to us and see if that's one of our answers. Uh, sell Swiss francs? No, you don't want to sell. Protection usually means you're going to buy. And so it looks like we want to buy the puts. Uh, what is the concern of the corporate? Oh, look at that rationale. My goodness. Uh, what is the concern? Let me clean up the slide here. What is the concern of this corporation? If when the Swiss company pays for the tools, the value of the Swiss sink has fallen against the dollar. You're going to get less dollars. Yep. For example, if the bill is for 10, 100,000 Swiss francs at the time of the sell, and the Swiss franc is worth 110,000, each uh, Swiss franc is worth $1.10. The decline to $1.05 means $105. That's, I think, pretty, pretty big rationale for that question, but you know, you get the idea here. Oh, my goodness, it goes on. <laughs> I, I think the biggest takeaway is this thing about the two important uh, memory aid devices. And the two important memory aid devices, well, let me get a bigger font. That's worthy of a bigger font. And that is Epic and IPEC, which is the opposite. So exporters, US exporters by puts and US importers by calls. And it's the opposite. It's the opposite uh, for uh, the Japanese perspective the Japanese person shipping product in the U.S. or the Swiss company. So that would be importers by puts, exported by calls, if we're talking about the foreign uh, company. I'm just going back up to see our explanation. They didn't give us any dollar choices, but they are reminding us once again, let me clean up my slide. They are reminding us once again in this question that there, that's never going to be on, on the right answer. So, you know, on the test, sometimes they'll give you two that are something to do with dollars and you can immediately just toss them out. And then uh, IPAC is for importers by puts and exporters by calls. It's the opposite. So that is important as a memory aid. That's where the pointer to on the test, those two uh, memory aid devices. The fancy word for memory aids are mnemonics. Mnemonics. Okay, let's look at our next one. Uh, Royal Duck Duck Manufacturing, uh, located in the United States, exports 25% of its high quality down overcoats to distributors in Canada to protect against currency risk. So I'm worried about the loonie, that's the Canadian dollar. And what I'm worried again, again, is I'm gonna sell in Canada and the loonie goes down and I get less dollars. So I'm a US exporter. So what I wanna do is uh, buy puts on the Canadian uh, dollar, the Canadian currency, the loonie. So I wanna purchase puts. Uh, by the way, you should know that D can't possibly be right, right? Because the US currency is never the right answer. It's not a foreign currency. So I'm not being facetious, you can just toss out D. It looks like I want to purchase some puts. There we go. Oh boy, I love it. They're giving you those huge rationales. My goodness. <laughs> I'll leave it if you don't have the Kaplan Q Bank. Uh, if you have the Kaplan Q Bank, I'll leave it to you to, uh, you know, look up QID 1374665 and uh, read that rationale. I think it's a little overkill. Uh, epic. I'm trying to, the reason I'm being uh, kind of lazy on this one is I'm trying to bring this in at something approximating 30 minutes, so. Uh, all US exchange listed foreign currency options are settled in the underlying foreign currency. No, that would be a mess. They're settled in US dollars, that just makes sense. It makes it easier. And they settle on third Friday, so it looks like I went two and three, boom. 
Yeah, maybe in terms of tests, I think lower probability. Just like equity options. Again, I think that one of the biggest takeaways I hope you get is if you don't panic, these have more in common than they do differences. All right, so UK company exports sweaters to the US. Well, it paid on US dollars upon delivery. So again, if I'm a UK company, I'm getting dollars, I got to turn them to British pounds. And what I'm afraid of is the dollar is weak and I'm not going to get as many British pounds. So if the dollar is weak, what I'm really saying is the British pound is strong. I mean, there's an inverse relationship with these currencies. You kind of got to make a U-turn. And so here, I think what I'm going to want to do is buy some calls on the pound and hope that my pound call contracts, whatever I lose in that spot exchange rate, when I get paid, I can make it up perhaps in uh, my call contract, right? Because if the dollar goes down, you know, my British pound is going up. So it looks like I want to buy some British pounds. Boom. Exporter buy puts on foreign currency, but there are no, this is down the US dollar. So British company there. All right, our last one, our last one. If the Swiss franc, so I told you what I like to do. And again, the biggest take, one of the biggest takeaways from this little thing, let me know if you found this productive because for things like this, like futures on the 65, and by the way, you can put in suggestions. If it doesn't support what I consider to be a full-blown narrative lecture, what I do instead is I'll do something like this. And so I'm just gonna put 56 there. I like to put my market price above or below my strike just to make my analysis easier. Uh, put down. So again, as long as you don't freak, oh my God, it's a Swiss franc. It doesn't matter. I mean, if the strike price is 59 and the Swiss franc is 56, we know that this is in the money. Now, uh, it looks like three points, but let's see what our choices are. Now, what I mean by that is, again, if you, you know you need in the money, that alone could get you, uh, there we go. So remember, I only even have one. I don't even need to worry about the three points because I actually only have one that says it's in the money. So there we go. So that's going to be three, whoop, three points. Boom. Okay, so let's see. Submit. I think we got 100. Yeah, okay. So let me clean up my slide. Um, I think we, I don't think we missed anything. Okay, cool. Let me stop sharing. Uh, I hope you found that helpful. I hope you found that helpful. Uh, remember, inch by inch, series seven is a cinch. Yard by yard, series seven is hard. I usually put these for a premiere, but I think in this case, I'll probably just post it uh, right to the channel. I, I like to say premieres for longer things, you know, that are worthy of a premiere. You know, so, but uh, let me know if you like this in terms of subject areas. What I mean by that is if there's a certain topic like this has been requested, non-equity option, and Dean isn't going to do a whole bunch of, uh, you know, a narrative lecture, I'll pull it from the Kaplan QBank. Again, shout out to Kaplan. Uh, for allowing a free look to you on their Kaplan QBank questions. And so if you don't have a Kaplan QBank, I highly recommend it to you. Uh, but sometimes this is uh, easier to do, and I think perhaps more productive than uh, you know a narrative PowerPoint presentation. All right, see you next time. Bye-bye.